after analysis models is that of model identification. Models must be specified so that there are enough pieces of information to give what we call unique estimates for all parameters specified in our models. Essentially, structural equation modeling involves estimating unknown parameters, for example, factor loadings or path coefficients that are specified in our model based on known parameters, specifically the covariances. There are two basic requirements for the identification of any kind of structural equation modeling. The first requirement is that there must be at least as many observations as model parameters that need to be estimated. And secondly, that every latent variable must be assigned a scale or a metric. Models that violate these requirements are not identified. And we call them under-identified in that we have more unknown parameters than known parameters. Identification involves determining whether a unique solution for a model can be, attain, can be obtained. Specifically, it requires more known versus unknown parameters. Identification, therefore, is a property of the model and not the data. Therefore, it does not depend on sample size. A model that is not identified, it remains to be unidentified regardless of whether the sample size is 100, 1,000, 10,000, or etc. Problems of evaluating our models often stem from model identification. A model is said to be identified if it is theoretically possible to derive unique estimates of each parameter. Therefore, identification is a property of the model, not the data. Once we have a model that is identified, we must then proceed to estimating the unknown parameters. Models that have more known versus unknown parameters are referred to as being over-identified. Over-identified models have an infinite number of solutions. These unknown parameters need to be estimated based on a mathematical criterion. The goal in structural equation modeling estimation methods is therefore to minimize the difference between the observed and the implied covariance matrices. And recall that our implied covariance matrices are those that are specified within our model. The most widely used estimation, estimation procedure in structural equation modeling is maximum likelihood estimation. Maximum likely, likelihood estimation is the default method in most structural equation modeling computer programs, such as AMOS or LISRL. It is considered what we call a normal theory method because it assumes that the population distribution for the endogenous variables, so those are our dependent variables, are, are normally distributed. Therefore, it may not be appropriate to use for estimating parameters that involve non-normally distributed dependent variables. Maximum likelihood is considered a full information estimation method, which means that estimates of the model parameters are calculated all at once. With our model estimation process, it begins with initial estimates, and these are imputed within the, within the computer program. AMOS, for example, will impute these values, which are called start values. The estimation process is called an iterative process, and it will stop when a minimum fitting criterion is reached. Specifically, this means it'll stop when the difference between the observed and the implied covariance matrices are minimized. After the model esti estimation process, we then proceed to the fourth step of assessing what we call our model fit. Over-identified models usually do not perfectly fit the data. Therefore, it's extremely important that we measure the degree of fit of such models. We have two main classes of what we call model fit indices. These are absolute fit indices and relative, or what are sometimes called comparative fit indices. 
Within these two classes of model fit indices, there are several ones used in the structural equation modeling literature. In this lecture, we'll briefly discuss the main types that are commonly reported in structural equation modeling papers. For further detail, refer to Klein's textbook entitled Principles and Practice of Structural Equation Modeling or your Tabachnik and Fidel textbook. The first class, known as absolute fit indices, look at the ability of the model to reproduce the observed covariance matrices. While the second class, the relative comparative fit indices, involve comparing the theoretical model specified to a baseline model, which often is what we call the null or the independence model, that being the model with no relationships among variables. Examining fit indices are extremely important to structural equation modeling as they're useful for testing certain types of hypotheses, especially those involving the comparison of different models evaluated with the same data. With our first class of model fit indices, known as our absolute fit indices, we have three main types, those being our model chi-squared, the root mean squared error of approximation, or the Renzi, and the goodness of fit, or the GFI. These are most commonly reported in structural equation modeling literature. Our model chi-square looks at the hypothesis that the observed and the implied covariance matrices are equal, so it tests this hypothesis. A non-significant chi-squared value so p-value greater than 0.05 would indicate a good fitting model. It suggests that there are few discrepancies between our observed and implied covariance matrices. However, one thing to note with the model chi-square is it's sensitive to sample size. Specifically, with large samples, we can often detect small differences between the sample and the population. Therefore, it tends to show good fit in small samples, so a non-significant chi-square, and bad fit, or a significant chi-square, in large samples with the same covariance matrix. Therefore, while it's very common to report the model chi-squared, it's also very important to look at other model fit indices, such as the Remsey or the goodness of fit. The Remsey looks at the average size of residuals Therefore, smaller values indicate a better fitting model. The advantage with using the REMC is it provides confidence intervals and significance tests. Values that are, are less than 0.10 represent an acceptable fitting model, whereas values less than 0.05 represent a good fitting model. And finally, with our goodness of fit indices, or GFI, Values that are greater than 0.90 are considered to be good fitting models. Again, these are the most commonly reported, but what's important is that we look at them together and not just one versus the other. The second classes of model fit indices is that of common relative fit indices. Recall that these fit indices involve comparing theoretical model to a baseline model. And this baseline model, what we call the null or independence models, specifically looks at a model with no relationships among variables. So these fit indices determine whether our model that we specify is better than a model where there's no relationships between the variables. The most commonly reported relative fit indices are that of normed fit index the norm fit index, the incremental fit index, and the comparative fit index. For all three of these fit indices, their values will range from zero to one, and generally those values that are greater than 0 0.90 suggest that we have a good fitting model. One comment about the rules of thumb for structural equation modeling fit indices is that we often see or hear reference to 0 0.90 or above to indicate acceptable model fit for indices such as GFI, CFI, or NFI. 
and we typically cite Bentler and Bonnet for this assertion. However, the basis for this assertion is rather thin. Specifically, what Bentler and Bonnet actually say in their textbook is that experience will be required to establish values of the indices that are associated with various degrees of meaningfulness of results. In our experience, models with overall fit indices of less than 0 0.90 can usually be improved substantially. Taking this together, we therefore just can't rely on cutoff values for our fit indices. We must also look at other information, such as the pattern of standardized residuals, the direction and magnitude of the correlations, as well as the beta weights. This information, as, as well as model fit ind index information, will help us determine whether or not our model is an overall good fitting model. The fifth and final step to conducting confirmatory factor analysis models is that of model respecification or modification. One thing to note with this step is that if you do have missing data, you will not be able to be given information from computer programs such as Amos to conduct modifications on your model. With this step, the goal is to improve our model fit. So it involves changing the model to fit the data. There are modification indices that are provided in programs such as Amos, which indicate things that you can do to your model, such as adding a correlation between an error term and an indicator. And they will tell you by doing this how much you will improve your chi-squared value. While these modifications may some, in some cases uh, be appropriate, there are caveats to such modification. Specifically, these modifications are post hoc and do capitalize on chance. Some of them may, may not be consistent with the overall theory that you're working with, and they capitalize on sampling error. These modifications may involve theory trimming, so deleting non-significant paths, and or theory building, so adding paths based on empirical indices, not theoretical evidence. As a general guideline, when conducting modification indices, these modifications must be theoretically consistent, as well as it would be important to replicate these modifications with a new data set. Before concluding this introduction to structural equation modeling lecture, let's look at some take home points. The first is with structural equation modeling, you must keep in mind theoretical and the clinical meaningfulness of your model. And to use theory as a guiding principle when, when developing your model and evaluating your model, particularly when looking at model fit indices and those modification indices that are are reported with Amos. When evaluating your model, it's also important to look at what we call the residuals and imply correlations. This information can be found on printouts of Amos as well as in Lisrel. And these look at the discrepancies between the sample covariance matrices, so what you the covariances you obtain from your data, and those implied by your model. Typically, when we see residual va values greater than plus or minus two standard deviations, this causes concern, which requires further investigation of our model. When evaluating a model, we must also look at the path of coefficients between the different variables. Look at the direction and the magnitude of those path coefficients or those beta values and see are they consistent with theory and with previous literature. It's also important to look at, see if whether or not there are any numeric problems with your model as well as the, the results that obtained by running your confirmatory factor analysis model. This requires looking at the direction and the magnitude of the residuals. So again, to see if there are scores that are greater than plus or minus two standard deviations. And to look at the pattern of the standardized residuals.